But we will begin with uh, Richard John, and then followed with uh, Martin Horacek, followed with a panel discussion. So, uh, who is introducing Richard John? <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. And thank you, for Marie, Marie Ann Thomas, for asking me to introduce Richard John, um, which I will do now. Richard John is uh, an associate professor at the University of Miami School of Architecture, and he's the former director of the Prince of Wales Institute of Architecture. And in 2001, he literally wrote the book uh, on Thomas. Uh, when he when he authored Thomas Gordon Smith and the Rebirth of Classical Architecture. He has also published books on the work of Robert Adam and John Simpson, and he has served as the editor of The Classicist on uh, several volumes, um, including 8, 9, and 10. Uh, he teaches design and architectural history at Miami, uh, and he also runs the Tradarch Listserv, which many of you are probably familiar. Uh, and he facilitates discussions there on many aspects of uh, theory and practice uh, of traditional architecture. Dr. John has received degrees from Peterhouse University of Cambridge, Columbia University, the Warburg Institute at the University of London and Merton College, University of Oxford. Um, and he has recently begun new research uh, for a critical biography of Leon Creer, uh, utilizing the Creer archive uh, recently acquired by the University of Notre Dame. And he's started some of that work here. Um, and I know we'll be joined by many other scholars uh, at this important collection. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. John, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Amy, for that uh, very kind introduction, and uh, thank you also. Thank you also, Michael, for the very kind invitation uh, to participate in this celebration of Thomas's career. Uh, I should like to talk this afternoon a little bit about the role that historians played in shaping Thomas Gordon Smith's development as an architect. I will be focusing on those formative years before his first built projects were realized. As you might expect, the material I'm presenting draws on the research and writing I did 18 years ago for my own book on Thomas. In December 1970, Thomas, then 22 years old and recently graduated in painting from Berkeley, married the 19-year-old Marika Wilson. And it's in September of the following year, they set off on a belated honeymoon for a seven-month trip in Europe. They spent two months in Vicenza, where Smith worked, studied the work of Palladio intensively by studying, visiting his buildings, and reading in the well-stocked library of the Centro Internazionale di Studi di Architettura Andrea Palladio, located in the Palazzo Valmarana, shown here. A board member of the Centro rented them an apartment during their stay, and from this base, they visited 75 16th and 17th century villas in the Veneto. Thomas did not restrict his interest to historic buildings while in Italy, however. Before leaving the United States, he had prepared a detailed guidebook of what he hoped to see. And in this, he included some illustrations clipped from Casabella of recent buildings by the architect and historian Paolo Portoghese. Not knowing exactly where they might be located, Smith showed the pictures to an assistant in the tourist information kiosk when they arrived in Florence and asked if she could help him find them. <laughs> As the works in which Thomas was interested were public buildings, the tourist information officer tried looking them up in local directories. But having little success, she suggested they do some sightseeing and return later to find out what progress she had made. When they came back, they were amazed to discover that having failed to locate them in any reference books, she had simply called Portoghese in Rome and asked where these buildings of his were. The architect, surprised that a young American tourist was so interested in his work, suggested that if Thomas and his wife were coming to Rome, he would like to offer them lunch and show them examples of his work there. In due course, therefore, 
They visited Portuguese in his penthouse apartment where they found walls covered with William Morris paper and hung with engravings of Borromini's buildings. They ate lunch on the terrace overlooking the gardens of the Villa Medici, and afterwards Portuguese took them to see his Casa Andres, which you hear, and his Casa Baldi, 1961. Later, Thomas would describe how Portuguese's daring use of Baroque elements in contemporary buildings had a profound impact on him, even though he regretted that the references to Baroque sources such as Borromini's Sant'Andrea della Frate were so abstracted. Portuguese's relationship to the past, however, went deeper than the borrowing of motifs. Portuguese himself has related how, on first entering architecture school, he rapidly realized that those who were supposed to be teaching him, quote, were absolutely unable to do so because they didn't know anything and therefore I kidded myself that I would find a master from several centuries earlier." End quote. Portuguese thus attempted to forge a pupil-teacher relationship with Borromini as though they were master and apprentice rather than with any of his university tutors. This type of apprenticeship to long dead masters rather than living practitioners was to prove a fruitful model for Thomas in his own development as an architect. This extended stay in Italy confirmed Thomas in his desire to pursue architecture. And so once back in the United States, he returned to his alma mater, Berkeley, to enroll in the MARC program. Thomas rapidly formed a close bond with one of the most distinguished modernists on the faculty of the school, Joseph Escherich, taking a number of independent studies with him. Mm. Escherich, by then, in his 60s, had earned widespread acclaim uh, in the 1950s and 60s for his spare updating of the Bay Area style, particularly in his residential work, such as the house shown here. He was tolerant of Thomas's interest in the Prairie style and Palladio, perhaps because he himself had exhibited a certain eclecticism in his own work and had notably collaborated with the aged Maybeck in the 1950s. Another teacher who was enormously supportive of Thomas was the historian David Gephardt. Though he was a professor at the University of California at Santa Barbara, Thomas chose Gephardt to supervise his thesis on John Hudson Thomas, a Nevada-born architect who had studied architecture at Berkeley under John Galen Howard and stayed on to practice in the area for the rest of his life. Having established his reputation early on with a series of redwood bungalows, his spatially experimental work in the second decade of the 20th century, often in stuccoed masonry, drew eclectic from a broad range of sources, including the secession movement and the prairie style, as you can see in this 1911 house here. In addition to fulfilling the requirements of his master's degree, Thomas's research on John Hudson Thomas bore fruit in several other ways. First, the connection he established with the owners of houses uh, led to several commissions to restore, extend, or remodel their homes, such as this addition of the dormer to the Zuckerman house. Secondly, he was able to draw on the findings of his research as the basis for lectures and walking tours before finally publishing a less, an essay on Hudson Thomas in this book on Californian arts and crafts architects. David Gephardt had earned a certain notoriety as a critic for his praise of the new Getty Museum in Malibu shown here. This building, designed by Langdon and Wilson architects with advice from the archaeologist Norman Neuerberg, had been widely criticized for being closely modeled on the Villa of Papyri at Herculaneum. Given his public sympathies, it is not surprising, therefore, that Gephardt encouraged Thomas's enthusiasm for historical precedence. However, he could become critical when, in his opinion, the tribute to the past was too slavish, as it was in one studio design project which Thomas executed in the Prairie style. In the fallow years immediately following Thomas's graduation, Gephardt was hugely encouraging. In response to a letter from Thomas describing how some of his drawings were being exhibited at the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York, he urged Thomas to, quote, to get at it and get something built. I, for one, would like to see one of your creatures in the real live world. <laughs> he would later pay Thomas a huge compliment by illustrating the house that Thomas built for his family in Richmond, California, on the cover of his popular guide to architecture in San Francisco and Northern California, shown here. Thomas, in return, publicly thanked him for having, quote, alerted me to the difference between plagiarism and emulation in architecture. 
Well, it's still in architecture school. Thomas had conducted a number of detailed surveys of historic buildings. In the fall of 1973, he made axonometric and measured drawings of the second Wallen Maybeck house, which Bernard Maybeck had designed for his son in 1937. And these were subsequently published in the monograph on Maybeck by the architect and historian Kenneth Cardwell in 1977, the cover of which is shown here. Since the children of the owners of the house had been friends of Thomas's at high school, he had known this technologically innovative but stylistically traditional building as a teenager, and his first sketch was made when he was just 20 years old, shown here, and later he published a scholarly article on the unique methods and materials used in its construction. Thomas had his first opportunity to measure a 19th century house when in the summer of 1974, Cardwell recruited him to a team of five draftsmen to record an adobe in Monterey, which had been built by John Cooper in 1832. Thomas went on to spend the rest of the summer working as a draftsman for the Historic American Building Survey in Tennessee, where he helped measure five 19th century buildings, recording them with ink on Myler drawings. One of these was the Samuel Cleage House in Athens, Tennessee, built of brick in about 1825, which had several noteworthy features, including step gables, molded brick cornices, and an ornate fanlight. Fan light. And I show you two uh, of the Ham's drawings on which Thomas worked on the screen. After graduation from the master's program, Thomas turned his mind to designing a house for his own family, a project which would go through numerous iterations for different potential sites in the Bay Area over the next few years. While the earliest house for a lot on Sunnyside Street had no traditional features at all, a classical flavor developed markedly from one scheme to the next so that the fourth house could be legitimately given the name the Doric House. The use of the Doric architrave to bind the two parts of this house together, the grandiose classical billboard in the front being tied back to the modest Californian bungalow in the rear, suggests a rapid advance in understanding of the potential application of the classical canon. Despite the Venturian decorated shed approach to the house as a whole, Thomas treated the Doric architrave in a rather sophisticated fashion. He omitted the triglyphs in the frieze, but indicated where they would have been by retaining the regularly spaced guti and reguli below the taenia. He may have been inspired by Maybeck's use of this device on a windowsill in the Oscar Mara studio house in Berkeley, which I show you there, um, or by an earlier European source with which he was also familiar, the early 16th century Villa della Torre at Fumane near Verona. You can see that same device uh, being used here. At the end of 1976, Thomas returned to Europe with the funds from the John K. Branner Traveling Fellowship he'd been awarded by Berkeley on his graduation. This trip, primarily to Central Europe, was planned beforehand in minute detail, enabling him to see as much as possible in the shortest time. His highly prepared approach to travel, marking up maps and assembling homemade guidebooks of all the buildings he wished to see in advance, benefited Thomas on numerous occasions and is indicative of his ferocious appetite for architectural history. The purpose of this trip was twofold. First, to see Kilian Ignaz Dietzenhofer's work, exuberant masterpieces of Bohemian Baroque architecture, such as St. Florian's Chapel, Kladno shown here, and at the same time, to look at examples of early modernism, in particular buildings by Le Corbusier, André Lussat, Walter Gropius, and Mies van der Rohe, such as the Villa Tungerhat, shown here. This seeming contradiction in pursuing these divergent interests was already apparent to Thomas. Yet what primarily appealed to him about early modernist buildings were their expressionistic qualities and the invigorating freshness of bohemian cubism, aspects which were rapidly lost as the movement spread and became formulaic. Thomas's appreciation of the dialectic between classicism and modernism was evident from the visual dichotomy in the Doric house. And this tension between innovation and tradition was soon to become central to his work. On Thomas's return to the States, the firm for which he worked in the Bay Area sent him to the island of Guam in the Pacific Ocean, where he spent six months measuring all the windows in hundreds of identical Navy-built houses. <laughs> <laughs> he alleviated the boredom of this depressing task by developing his own hypothetical projects, again thinking in terms of a house for his family, though he never seriously intended to remain on the island. This time, 
he chose a breathtaking site on Tagachang Beach with a spectacular view out over the Pacific Ocean. While one might have imagined that the, his previous house projects for the Bay Area had strong regional flavor because he'd grown up surrounded by Californian bungalows and craftsman houses, Thomas exhibited in Guam an impressive facility for immersing himself in the local vernacular. He also demonstrated the flexibility of the classical canon in accommodating variations derived from the indigenous culture. For instance, the Ionic capitals were to be executed in terracotta in following the form of the native thun shell. And you can see one of these on the small brochure Thomas prepared on the project, sending 50 copies to people he thought might be interested, in particular to those he viewed as his intellectual mentors. These included Christian Norbrook Schultz, the architect and historian at the University of Oslo. While Thomas had not yet met Schultz personally, it had been his 1968 book on Dietzenhofer and Bohemian Baroque architecture, which had inspired Thomas to take his recent influential trip to Bohemia. Yeah. Norbert Schultz responded to the brochure with enthusiasm, writing that he found Thomas's approach, quote, fascinating. And he admired his, quote, sensitive interpretation of Baroque themes and expressed the desire to follow the progress of Thomas's work and write about it. Another fruitful friendship which resulted from sending out a brochure was Charles Jenks, who was then teaching at the University of California at Los Angeles. Jenks, born in America but trained as an architectural historian in Britain under Rainer Bannum, was the earliest and most influential historian of postmodernism. He developed a diagram reminiscent of those devised by paleontologists to show evolutionary sequences, which he used to illustrate the tradition within 20th century architecture. He constantly updated this evolutionary tree, as he called it, and he included Tom Smith in one of the first he drew up to delineate the main strands within postmodernism. <laughs> While Thomas was undoubtedly delighted to be listed in such a setting by Jenks, he tactfully wrote to him and asked, if you republish the genealogy of postmodern architecture, would you please change the abbreviation of my name <laughs> to TJ, TG Smith? <laughs> <laughs> on his return from Guam, Thomas continued to work on the schemes for a family house in the Bay Area. Initially, they, these were inspired by the Quonset huts he had seen on the island, such as the Paulonia and Shell houses shown here. But before long, he was exploring a more ambitious scheme for a lot in Matthew Street in Berkeley. He began the design again on a concert hut, but the, and the classical detailing would be provided by three Doric columns, which Thomas, since the age of 15, had known were for sale, chained outside a Berkeley antique shop. <laughs> so this is the interest in spolia that Peter had talked about. <laughs> the these budgetary constraints were soon abandoned, however, with the final design calling for a conventional wood frame construction and four rather than three columns for the portico. The colorful palette of the Paulonia house now had become a fully resolved Beaux-Arts restitution of ancient Greek polychromy. The inspiration for this dramatic experiment was an exhibition of 18th and 19th century student work from the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris, organized by Arthur Drexler at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The exhibition, which opened in October 1975, included numerous archaeological envois executed in the early 19th century by French students on trips to Greece and Sicily, such as Bernard Lovio's of the Parthenon. Another notable example was Henri Lubrou's re reconstruction of the Temple of Hercules at Cori, which Drexler used for the cover illustration of his book on this subject. In much the same way as these colorful drawings shocked the architectural establishment when they were first executed, this exhibition demolished the current preoccupation, preconception rather, of ancient Greek architecture as cold and rational, precisely those qualities which had appealed to early modernists, reconfirming instead that it was resplendent with color. The contemporary interest shown in polychromy by American architects is amply demonstrated by Charles Moore's Piazza d'Italia in New Orleans, the design of which was developed around the same time as the exhibition, even though construction of the seminal postmodernist work was not completed until 1978. In one of the evocative drawings for the Matthew Street House, Thomas placed a single Corinthian column in front of the terrace. This signified, in Thomas's words, 
quote, the potential for the regeneration of classical architecture typical of the Corinthian, end quote. In examining the sequence of projects for the Smith family house, one has a sense of the same elements being endlessly transposed and rearranged, rather as though one is looking through a constantly revolving kaleidoscope. And yet a clear progression can be divined. The apparent internal tension, which was initially supplied through the opposition of classical detail and modern formal materials, was now being finally expressed through the mannered departures from the classical canon. In the Matthew Street house, the columns of the two-story portico are not evenly arranged on all three sides or even just across the front, but irregularly disposed to one side and combined with an anter extension of the wall. A rational explanation might be provided in the need to shield the portico from the neighboring house to the north and to give it a southwestern aspect to catch the sun. Yet the result runs so contrary to the classical canon that it was, without any doubt, the quirky and unorthodox visual effect which was paramount. Out. Thomas used the development of the Matthew Street House to illustrate his design process in an article he wrote for an issue of the Journal of Architectural Education, uh, edited uh, by Richard B. Oliver. Oliver, the curator of architecture and design at the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York, had included seven of Thomas's drawings and a model in the ornament exhibition he organized at the Cooper Hewitt about the same time. Thomas began the article by stating succinctly that, quote, Eclecticism is a method of architectural design, not a style. I am eclectic in my approach to design. I draw my sources from tradition, then redraw them to contribute new forms to tradition. I use elements of historical design in my work. I maintain that the results are different from the antiquarian's academic exercise for historical revival. I reject a doctrinaire approach to sources." End quote. As his interest in canonic classicism grew, Thomas came to realize that what he needed more than anything else was a prolonged period of study in Rome. He had accordingly submitted applications for a fellowship to the American Academy in Rome. In 1978, after two unlucky submissions, he was successful and was awarded the coveted Rome Prize. The jury that year consisted of, amongst others, Charles Moore, Stanley Teigerman, and Romaldo Giorgola. Thomas had met Moore, a the former chairman of the School of Architecture at Berkeley, when he was the guest speaker at Thomas's own graduation ceremony there in 1975. And while Thomas confesses not to having even heard of Moore when he began his architectural degree, his designs immediately after graduation show a clear knowledge of Moore's residential work. Though Moore was never to go as far as advocating a literal revival of the classical tradition, his work showed an appreciation of the human need for ornament and the value of historical precedent. In fact, one common interest which brought Thomas and Moore together was their shared enthusiasm for using architectural salvage in contemporary buildings. Moore came to San Francisco from Los Angeles in 1979 to speak in a public lecture series organized by Thomas. While visiting, he admired an oval dormer window from a recently demolished residence for the elderly, St. Anne's Home for the Aged and Poor. I show you there those oval windows. Uh, apparently, uh, and, and uh, for the aged and poor, which Thomas was thinking of using in a project. Subsequently, Thomas sent Moore a drawing of one of the dormers and details of their price, which is $100, and the address of the salvage firm which was selling them. Moore purchased one and incorporated it uh, in the interior of his own apartment in the Moore Roger Hofflander condominium in West Los Angeles, which he was just completing. And you can see that there. <laughs> Apparently, it was Charles Moore who, on opening Thomas's portfolio during the judging of the applications for the Rome Prize, uh, insisted uh, that this was the person that they should award the prize to that year. The impact on Thomas of this year in Rome was as much a result of his contact with the distinguished scholars at the American Academy uh, as his exposure to the extraordinary buildings of the Eternal City. Thomas had not by then, and was in fact never to have the opportunity of working closely with the great architect 
in the traditional relationship of an apprentice to master. At the academy, on the other hand, he was to develop a close working relationship with a number of historians. One of these, Joseph Connors, a professor at Columbia University, had trained as an architectural historian under Richard Krautheimer, James Ackerman, and Henry, Henry Millen at Harvard. He was working on one of the greatest misunderstood geniuses of Roman Baroque architecture, Francesco Borromini, publishing his seminal study of Borromini's Roman oratory in the following year, 1980. Both Connors and Thomas shared an interest in the rigor of Borromini's architecture and his profound understanding of the classical canon, qualities which had not previously been appreciated by critics. Thomas's second major influence was an art historian, John Belden Scott, who was working on the iconography of Pietro da Cortona's ceilings at the Palazzo Barberini. Before Thomas collaborated with Scott, none of his projects had a developed program of iconography, though his interest in the potential of architectural ornament to carry meaning is apparent from examples in his designs, such as that lone Corinthian column as a symbol of rebirth. Afterwards, Thomas's work would consistently feature elaborate iconographic programs executed either in fresco or sculpture, beginning with the major design project which Thomas undertook during his year in Rome, an oratory dedicated to Saint Jean Vianney, shown here. While this project was begun as an academic exercise, the impetus to complete it was given a great boost when Christian Norberg Schultz informed Thomas at a Christmas party that he had been selected as one of the main participants in the Venice Biennale for the next year. The result was months of intense activity for Thomas as he designed and constructed his exhibition and redrew a number of his previous projects for presentation. The organization of the International Architectural Exhibition for the 1980 Venice Biennale was given to Paolo Portoghese, whom, as we've heard, Thomas had first met by chance eight years previously. Of a total of 75 architects who would be exhibiting, only 20 had been selected to design facades, which would be constructed to create an internal street in the former rope factory of the Venice Arsenal. This Strada Novissima, which has had as its theme the presence of the past, proved to be a key event in the establishment of postmodernism as an international movement, with the participation of architects not just from Italy and the United States, but also France, Germany, Spain, and Japan. As might be imagined from the postmodern flavor of the event, most of the contributions were either ironic or abstract in their reference to historical traditions. Thomas was almost alone in adopting a literate treatment for his classical facade in the Strada. A pair of giant Doric pilasters supporting a triglyph frieze frame a concave niche. The frieze is pierced by a central opening allowing views over the Strada from the gallery above and is enriched by painted metopes representing Michelangelo and Borromini, the two guiding lights of Thomas, Th Thomas's vigorous composition. Within the niche, there is a secondary order consisting of a pair of freestanding Corinthian Solomonic columns set diagonally to divine, define a shallow elliptical space in front of a doorway. The relationship established between the major and minor orders is similar to that used by Michelangelo in his Palazzi on the Campidoglio. Thomas was fascinated by the way in which variations on this hierarchical arrangement were used by later architects, such as Borromini in his San Carlino alla Quattro Fontane, shown here. In Thomas's facade, the entablature of the minor order follows the curve of the apse flush with the wall plane, only darting forward as Rizalti over each column. The gently curving wall of the apse is painted with an ambitious iconographic program. The ionic architrave and pediment of the door are both painted in trompe l'oeil with a single word inscription, architectura, above the opening, and a tondo in the tympanum featuring in grisaille the instruments of the architect, including a rule, T-square, and dividers. Above the portal, three allegorical figures are painted. One on one side of the pediment in light colors, architectura and disegno engage in dialogue, while in a much darker hue, their antithesis, errore, turns his back on them, looking down to the ground. On either side of the doorway, two long rectangular panels contain a total of 12 vignettes of Thomas's earlier projects, the division into two groups, one below disegno and the other below 
Errore, <laughs> indicated which of these earlier projects now still met with Thomas's approval and which were now rejected. <laughs> this public act of self-criticism demonstrates how rap rapidly Thomas's architectural convictions had developed during his ro year in Rome. The exhibition behind the facade displayed full sets of drawings for these projects and for the oratory that he had designed at the Academy. The essential architectural elements of which had been reconfigured into the facade itself. Like all the other exhibitors, Thomas wrote a statement for the catalogue. Before submitting it for publication, however, he showed it to the Harvard architectural historian James Ackerman, who was then staying at the American Academy. As an acknowledged expert on the architecture of Michelangelo, one might have expected Ackerman to have some enthusiasm or at least sympathy for a young practitioner who was so clearly influenced by the Renaissance master. His written response to Thomas's statement, while intended constructively, <laughs> sums up much of the flawed thinking in the opposition of modernists to a revival of classicism in architecture. Quote, my concern is that for a tradition to function, I believe it should be unconsciously shared by most or many members of a society. If you argue for the viability of the classical language, you should suggest the way in which a society like ours, which has lost contact with it, is going to regain contact. You can't simply build classical buildings like you can't start talking classical Greek and expect people to know what you're saying. <laughs> Why should the classical tradition be given precedence over any major historical model? Make me feel that never having wanted to see a classical building made in my lifetime makes me an idiot and forces me to change what I think." End quote. It is curious that Ackerman should fall prey to familiar fallacies. Unlike a language which needs an individual to learn to speak it or read it for it to be alive, in order for an understanding of an architectural idiom to develop, it simply needs to be seen in the world around us, ordering social and political intercourse through its hierarchy of forms. While few major buildings in the United States had been built in the classical tradition since John Russell Pope's National Gallery in Washington was completed in 1941, all Americans would be familiar with classical architecture through its use in houses, banks, post offices, railway stations, courthouses, libraries, and museums in every major city. From the Capitol, the Supreme Court, the White House, down to the humblest branch library or post office, the democratic underpinnings of American society were given architectural expression through the classical language. Unlike ancient Greek, this was not a dead language which has lost to obscurity through the passage of 2000 years, but a living tradition which had enjoyed a startling renaissance at the turn of the 20th century with the Beaux-Arts movement and was still flourishing four decades later. By contrast to Ackerman, Charles Jenks, in his review of the Biennale, observed that, quote, Smith is the only architect here to treat the classical tradition as a living discourse, end quote. In a fundamental way, this was quite literally true. Cinecita, the film set construction company who were responsible for building the exhibition, told Thomas on seeing his design for the first time that he would have to modify it as they did not know how to construct the twisted Solomonic columns. <laughs> Unwilling to compromise his design, Thomas realized that he would have to make the columns himself. Of course, he had no idea how to go about it either. <laughs> but he began by looking at treatises by Baroque designers to find out. Both Giacomo Barozzi da Vagnola in his La Regola delle Cinque Ordini di Architettura and Guarino Guarini in his Architettura Civile gave methods for constructing the column mathematically. But Thomas found the clearest method was given by the Jesuit painter and architect Andrea Pozzo in his Perspectiva Pictorum et Architectorum, which Thomas consulted in the Bibliotheca Herziana. This experience of using the same treatises that architects themselves had utilized three centuries earlier 
not merely as a scholarly exercise, but as a genuine tool for design and execution, proved to be a formative one for Thomas. It gave him an insight into how the classical tradition had been continually developed in the light of contemporary circumstances, and then handed on from generation to generation via buildings and treatises. Despite the small scale of this Biennale project, Thomas succeeded in demonstrating to those attending the exhibition the communicative power of the classical tradition, both through formal devices, such as the tension between the orthogonal austerity of the Doric frame and the dynamic niche within, and semantic ones with the detailed iconographic program. The Yale architectural historian Vincent Scully, writing in the catalogue of the Biennale, characterized this quality as follows, quote, Smith's classical orders begin to resemble those of Maybeck in their Baroque primitive power. Smith stands alone in America, I think, in the haunting aura with which he can endow his images, end quote. I hope in this short talk, I've been able to give you some sense of how Thomas Gordon Smith consciously sought out the advice and guidance of historians and the important role which they played during his formative years as a young architect. Great. It's my pleasure to introduce Martin Horacek um, from Berno University of Technology. Martin teaches at the Faculty of Architecture at Berno University of Technology, as well as the Department of Art Education at Palatsky University and at the Department of Art History at um, uh, Masaryk University in Berno. He studied art history um, at Palatsky University in Olomouc, receiving his PhD in 2005. Martin is interested in architecture of the 18th and 21st centuries, heritage, conservation, historiography, and theory of art and art education. He is the author of two books. I'll translate these in English. The Strict Renaissance in 19th Century Bohemian Architecture and the Contemporary Debates About Style, published in 2002. And Toward a More Beautiful World, Traditionalism in Architecture of the 20th and 21st Century, published in 2013. Would you please welcome Martin Horacek. This one and the laser is right there. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, when I was kindly asked by Professor Likudis to attend this colloquium celebrating Thomas, there was a note included in the invitation letter that Thomas had suggested a topic of my speech, a view of current classical architecture in Europe and the United States. Well, what does it mean when we are talking about current classical architecture? One meaning could point to architecture designed in recent years, say since the year 2000. Nevertheless, I would now suggest the broader meaning of the attribute current. In a sense, everything we experience during our lives is current. There is no history and there is no future. Instead, we have memories that we place somewhere in space and time to make them intelligible. And we have plans, expectations or visions that we place in another intersection of space-time web. And that I think is applicable also in the case of architecture. 
Many of us were taught that so-called historical architecture is present in one side, <laughs> and contemporary or current architecture exists in another side. And many of us uh, were told that historical architecture is recognizable by the application of so-called historical styles that are characteristic for one particular period. <laughs> And that is why our period or our time is bound to create its own distinctive style. We in this room perhaps do not share such an approach, or uh, at least we find it questionable. As far as I can derive from my own experience with non-professional audience, thank you, most people do not have a need to distinguish architecture in a timeline according to its style. once more. <laughs> I live in the city of Brno, where the most famous building is definitely the Tugendhat House designed by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe in 1928 and listed as UNESCO World Heritage Site. For pupils and students in Brno, the Tugendhat House might become the first real great architecture they have ever visited during their school excursions. Uh, and their sense for architecture might be only later calibrated by classical examples. Um, Palace of Lednice nearby Brno, close, uh, close to the city of Brno. Modernism entered their lives earlier, while classicism later. It's only an additional information that makes modernism more contemporary and classicism more historical for young people from Brno. An information that might be in an odd contradiction with their individual experience. Let me employ this reasoning based on an individual experience rather than on knowledge learned at school, also in the particular case of classical architecture. For example, people in the US might become more familiar with classical architecture first thanks to their private houses or homes. Later, thanks to visit to some protected landmark from 17th, 18th or 19th century. Or to a museum with excavations from the Mediterranean. Only sometimes, and relatively late, they meet classical buildings in Greece, Italy or France, and such a meeting might top up their notion of classicism in architecture. What I would like to say is that everyone has his or her own chronology of architecture, private chronology, and chronology of classical architecture as well. This chronology often disagrees with the official chronology based on hypothesis on development of style taught by art historians. Another example, my private chronology of friendship with classical architecture is also not evolutionary correct. In my childhood, I spent much time inside this Rococo Chateau of Namish, designed by a French emigre, Isidore Ganeval, in 1760s. My grandma had been employed there as a custodian. Later on, I roamed the streets of my hometown, Olomouc, in Moravia, shaped mostly in the Baroque style and ornated with a collection of six fountains and two uh, great Baroque columns. I consider this decoration as normal. <laughs> <laughs> and, sorry. I remember my surprise from the strikingly different urban milieu in the outskirts of follow modes. I made real classical antiquities in 1990, uh, in my age of 12, in the Kunsthistorisches Museum of uh, Vienna after the fall of the Iron Curtain. In a few following years, I visited Rome, Athens, Naples, and so on with their main historical spots, thanks to generosity of my parents. So the way I experienced classical culture might be called reversed, <laughs> considering the proper evolutionary approach that some distinguished art historian would recommend. <laughs> In fact, current classical architecture includes every 
classical architecture and particularly current is rather the approach of people to it. So how do people face classical architecture nowadays? What are the prospects of classical architecture in the broadest sense of the notion in our global society? We can witness a variety of attitudes to classical architecture in our times. Let us begin with the worst one. We might call it devastational. One should mention damages in Palmyra, Syria, motivated not by aesthetic bias, but by iconoclastic misinterpretation of cultural heritage. Paradoxically, the landmarks of Palmyra were devastated not because they were not protected and their value was not recognized by local people. On the contrary, these landmarks were damaged due to their protection and due to their recognized value in the eyes of people. The situation is outraging, but it's not new, neither uh, the ideology nor the effects. In the 1950s or 1960s, uh, a municipal program took place, for example, in Vienna, with subventions for public and private property owners for so-called cleaning facades. Yes, this one. <laughs> From uh, quoting, tasteless and useless decoration, in fact, that meant the removal of classical articulation made from stone or plaster. <coughs> in communist countries in 1960s, both our facades were purified as well for being considered outdated documents of bourgeoisie past. And here in the United States, one of the best achievements of the American Renaissance, the Penn Station in New York, was demolished in the same period and replaced by a poor construction of the Madison Square Garden simply because of financial profit. The second current approach to classical architecture might be called competitional. That means when modernist designers challenge the classical ones in order to show the supposed value of their work. The most famous examples represent new cultural centers juxtaposed to classical landmarks or embracing them, them like the new Acropolis Museum in Athens designed by Bernard Chumi and Michael Fotiadis, or uh, this is particularly beautiful detail. <laughs> <laughs> or this one, uh, Arapatsis Museum in Rome by Richard Mayer, or very fresh National Museum on African American History and Culture in the middle of the National Mall in Washington, D.C. by David Ajay. Every such a project causes controversies, however, because of a strong political support from highest authorities. Most of them are usually realized without regards to critical opinions. The third approach we might call conservational. What has survived up until today is appreciated and quite well maintained with the effort to keep the original style even when repairing damaged parts or replacing inappropriate additions. You can name plenty of historical buildings protected by law as museums or landmarks, for example, Mount Vernon or Versailles, or Roman villas in Cyprus, and so on and so on. Since 1960s, hundreds of Neighborhoods of European and American towns and cities have been proclaimed protected areas. <laughs> Civic movement, as well as stronger professional voice, led to terminating of so-called cleaning programs. Due to permanent lack of finances in the Central and Eastern Europe, large areas of old buildings were saved from modernization. Nowadays, after the change of political regime, they attract fans of classical architecture. Budapest is perhaps the most fascinating city in our region, placed on World Heritage List just because of his, its bazaar neighborhoods. Or Croatian capital, 
Zagreb seems extraordinary thanks to its 19th century master plan following ideas of city beauty from movement. Speaking of world heritage and classicism, two interesting proposals are being prepared just in these days. The timeless humanistic architecture of Jozef Plechnik in Ljubljana and Prague, and the architectural legacy of socialist realism in Eastern and Central Europe. The fourth current path to classicism we can call reconstructional. In exceptional cases, heavily damaged or totally vanished classical buildings are being built again, using all available knowledge of their original appearance. Much admirable work has been done during the last 25 years. Pavilions by Karl Friedrich Schinkel and his pupils were repaired or erected again in Potsdam. The Frauenkirche in Dresden. Great Palace of Venaria Reale, close to Turin, by Amedeo Castellamonte and Filippo Juvar. The small Palace of Costelets in eastern Bohemia, designed by Viennese architect Heinrich Koch. Roman villas of Carnuntum near Vienna, where archaeological evidence of ancient building technologies were scientifically tested, and so on. Finally, what about newly designed architecture and classical vocabulary in all possible dialects? Surely, thanks to Thomas Gordon Smith and other devoted classicists, we have students of classical design again. And we have alumni of courses in Notre Dame, Denver, Miami, Yale, London, working in studios mostly in the United States and England. However, recent attempts to renew classical architectural courses at universities in continental Europe were, I must admit, only partly successful. To mention another my experience, three years ago I prepared with my students an exercise focused on a hypothetical redesign of the iconic Tugendhat house in a selected traditional style. <laughs> The class ended with a public exhibition and survey where visitors voted for the best proposal according to their own taste. And the Yoni classical design uh, was awarded. Yes. See uh, Miss van der Rohe here. <laughs> <laughs> Despite this success, my proposal to hire Notre Dame graduate Lenka Tomášová to a position of a faculty member was not accepted for suspicion of questioning modernist stylistic unity of architectural education at our school. Never mind, we are trying again at another architectural school in Brno and within the framework of international network for traditional building architecture and urbanism. So, uh, recent work of, of Lenka uh, for her uh, own house, uh, for house of her parents in Ihlava, Moravia. When you would like to learn traditional design skills, far more acceptable way, at least in continental Europe, is still to enroll in a course of heritage conservation. Plenty of non-modernist architects utilize their potential under the disguise as conservationists. Uh, this is the work of my friend, Professor Václav Girsa, renovation of, uh, of facades uh, of Český Krumlov Castle. And this is a commission for a private, uh, private owner in Prague, a newly built addition to a um, former mansion in the outskirts of, uh, of Prague. Plenty of traditional artists are working only for private commissioners away from academic authorities. <laughs> Yet, fortunate coincidences happen and the results show the broader audience the vital spring of classical art, like in the case of New Fountain in Olomouc from the year 2002, um, designed by Czech-born French sculptor Ivan Timer. 
I can't predict the future of classical art and architecture. Maybe since the contemporary society demands spectacular events, some kind of classical Bilbao effect would be helpful in order to persuade the public that classical language can compete with the modernist one. Like the Sheikh Zayed Sultan bin Nahyan Mosque in Abu Dhabi, finished in 2007, became the new prominent landmark of this city. Other cities should be substantially enhanced by a new classical public monuments. The small island of Malta might bring an inspiration with uh, its magnificent, magnificent um, churches from the second the half of the 20th century, designed by a local, extraordinary local engineer, Guse D'Amato. Anyway, there are two other aspects of classical architecture probably more important than the, than the amount or size of newly constructed buildings. As British historian David Watkin pointed out many years ago, classical architecture is connected to a specific debate on architecture based on notions like beauty, humanistic, order, articulation, and so on. Modernist architects haven't been able to develop similarly logical discourse describing their own specific problems, and their texts and talks represent more poetry than theory or even science. The practice of classical architecture means also the practice of humanistic debate on architecture. One is impossible without the other, and one supports the other. Nowadays, we witness fascinating increase of knowledge of human health and ecology. The built environment is scrutinized also with regard to its architectural quality. What is scientifically test and proved? The classical language belongs to more natural architectural languages. That means more hardwired in human biology, more beneficial to human well-being. With such a proof, classical debate on architecture can be updated and classicists could attract influential supporters among scientists, environmentalists, psychologists, ecologists, or physicians. The second aspect and the last thing I would like to mention here is classical landscape. I think this is the most endangered feature of classical tradition, even more fragile than classical architecture. Remember the landscape of Roman Campania, the mythical landscape of Delphi, the cultural landscape of Sintra, Portugal, protected part, unprotected part. Compare old paintings with contemporary images. You might discuss if such a landscape is more classical or more romantic, but such a debate doesn't point to the heart of a matter. Simply, the landscape is disappearing, and that fact belongs to the worst aspects of so-called modernity. Classical architects were collaborating with nature. Their architecture was dignified by its natural surroundings, and the nature was harmonized by new architectural pieces. Unfortunately, such a cooperation has been rarely possible within the modernist frame. Instead of harmony, the sprawl has been created. Classical architect is always aware of the whole. His commission might be a small one, yet it's a part of one great continuous artistic achievement. Thank you very much for your attention. That was uh, that was wonderful. So uh, I think we'll now proceed to the panel discussion. Uh, Richard John will uh, moderate. 
No, no, I'll, I'll just go, I'll just go, I'll stand. It'd be easier for me, I think. Uh, so I, I've been asked to, um, I, I've been asked to moderate this uh, panel discussion, and uh, we have uh, about 35 minutes. Um, and so w w the way in which I think we'll organize it is um, I'll ask actually those who've already presented whether they have any um, opening comments to uh, to to make, uh, and then uh, we'll open it to the floor if there are questions from the audience, uh, and then perhaps at the end if there are any closing statements that the panelists would like to make. Um, uh, we will try and ensure there is some time uh, for that. Um, uh, for my part, I, I would actually um, like to just express my, my enormous gratitude uh, to uh, Thomas and Marika for their for their friendship. Um, I, when thinking about uh, what I might say today, I uh, look back through my notes. Uh, in fact, uh, that were prepared for a preface to my book, in, which was never, in fact, included, um, which talked about how I first met Thomas, and it was. Uh, in a very memorable uh, setting, uh, I had been invited uh, to a symposium uh, at a villa in the Peloponnese um, uh, built by an American, Charles Shroop. Uh, it was a, an event, actually, which was mainly uh, uh, organized by Richard Economakis in um, the, thank you, Richard, uh, the, the Villa Cavagallo, was it, uh, in, in 1994 at uh, uh, Coroni. Um, uh, and uh, many here, yeah, Michael was, 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 uh, was attending, and um, I had not previously uh, met uh, Thomas. I was at that time uh, a fellow of Merton College, and I was teaching uh, medieval and Renaissance Italian history uh, at Oxford. Um, and uh, during the uh, midday breaks, uh, from the colloquium sessions, I would slip down to the private beach that was associated uh, with the villa to uh, take a quick dip. Uh, Oxford not being very close to the, uh, the sea. Um, and uh, on one of these occasions, I, I came out and discovered that I wasn't alone on this private beach, but there was a figure with a bunch of papers um, sitting on a rock. Uh, poring over them and working through them, um, and I recognized him as one of the attendees of the colloquium I introduced myself, and it was Thomas working on his commentary on Vitruvius. Um, it made me feel very foolish that uh, I, I had been swimming instead of uh, 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 annotating an ancient text. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and in the next few years, I got to know Thomas quite well uh, when I was running the Prince's Institute, uh, and uh, Thomas was chair of the school here. Uh, we, we collaborated on a, a, a number of um, uh, occasions. Um, I remember a very memorable uh, visit to St. Petersburg, where um, Thomas was running a studio, which I think had some students from the, from the Prince's Institute, and uh, I, I gave a lecture, uh, particularly memorable because it was was during the, the white nights, and so I actually just spent the whole night wandering around looking at the architecture, uh, not, not really feeling I needed any sleep. Uh, and then uh, another memorable uh, trip uh, when we had organized a summer program for uh, the Prince of Wales' uh, school. Uh, it was actually being run by Christine um, uh, on the West Coast, and uh, Thomas then had uh, already made the decision to step down as chair of the School of Architecture, and I must admit it was the most liberated I'd ever seen Thomas. Um, uh, there was a, a wonderful infectious humor um, as uh, the, the burden of running a School of Architecture had been uh, lifted uh, from, uh, from his shoulders. It was uh, very striking, as he showed us 
for instance, uh, the Richmond Hill House and uh, took us around uh, some of those haunts in, in um, uh, Berkeley that he uh, knew and, and loved so well. So those are my opening remarks. Is there anything uh, that anyone on the panel would like to uh, add? Uh, perhaps Peter. Start on the left, of course. Yes, That's why I'm right, right here. Um, actually, I would just like to say I've had such a wonderful experience listening to all of you today, and I've learned a lot. And one of the things that I wanted to mention was Martin's recent uh, talk a moment ago, which was I found so compelling and liberating in a way. Now I don't work in the Metropolitan Museum anymore. I work for a historic preservation organization focused on classicism. I've never really thought about the idea of a backwards chronology. You know it from your hometown and you work your way backwards. Uh, it's just a marvelous way to introduce people to the concept of classicism. And I think it's something, a lesson that I will take away from it. The other thing I wanted to mention as well was Lotar's uh, wonderful talk in which uh, he, he was able to express the ineffable, <laughs> the idea, this concept of contrast and shadow and light. It's easy to talk about the mass of a classical building and its sort of idea of it looking like it belongs there in place. But this very notion of uh, the it's sort of the of shadow and light playing such an important role in what we consider uh, to be uh, fixed buildings, it's something that uh, I think we should concentrate a little bit more on in terms of how we interpret them and bring people to see them. You know, a great house like Milford was strategically cited to look to the north and the west as a great English country house would because the sun's at your back. What is the time of day when it is most beautiful? Perhaps the time of day is when the sun is now coming at it. So um, maybe um, a day of visiting and studying light in these places is mm -hmm. extraordinary as well. So anyway, I just those were a couple of thoughts I had and things that I practically can take away from this day. I don't know if that's useful or not. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. I join you in that uh, comment of having learned and seen um, the representatives uh, of um, dealing with architecture in a way that um, is different from other contemporary movements. My question to all of you is one out of a predicament, and it has to do with labeling. Keep in mind, in uh, the beginnings of the book Genesis, one thing that God did was giving name names to the things. Name giving is an abstract thing on the one side. On the other side, it brings a thing to life. This is why in this country, the United States, it's such a wonderful tradition to introduce yourself. Join any European conversation, into, uh, and Martin can uh, second me, I guess. Saying your name is the least important thing. You might have an entire conversation without having been introduced by name. So uh, to, to know each other by name makes the person or the subject matter, uh, something that is uh, uh, is at life. How do we? How do, how would we call then the movement that so many of us and the school here is advocating? I told you of that predicament of mine uh, early in my talk. Yes, we know that it is not modernism. In fact, modernism is that thing that uh, pe uh, people abhor of. Um, but then how do we call that movement that we find deserves attention is taught at this school? And, and, and that's a real question, um, because postmodernism is a nice thing, uh, but itself it's already dated. How do you feel, Peter? Uh, tell me, help me. Um, <laughs> ah. I'm at a predicament. Keep in mind, I teach the introductory course uh, um, on 
um, architectural history at the University of Pennsylvania. And I do this as from an art history department um, for the entire School of Architecture, more or less because they realized, oh, uh, they do it pretty well. In fact, no one of us uh, can really do what uh, art historians uh, these days can do. And so my, my course on architect and history, as I, call, as I called it, some 20 years ago, and uh, it's successfully maintained. How should I then call um, after modernism the period that we are in? Luther, if I may, I think this is actually part of the problem. Thank yes. you. Yes, indeed. Uh, not that we don't have a name. Uh, for what's happening today in architecture, but that we feel that we have to parse history and modern times into specific segments and say, this style belongs to that time, this to another and another. Um, lately, I've been referring to what's happening today across the breadth of classical, traditional, vernacular architecture, urbanism, building craft. I've just simply been referring to it as the new modern. I think about titles like the beauties of modern architecture. Yeah. The idea that we have allowed the term modern to be associated with a particular historical style is something that I think we should try to move beyond. It's a challenge because we want so much to name, as done in the book of Genesis, we yes. want to name and we want to categorize. Uh, we think of architecture and history as evolutionary and a kind of continuum of change. But instead, if we think of it as um, uh, a continuum of ideas and not so focused on, um, um, I suppose what I'm trying to say in a way with respect to the historians in the room is that I actually think that historiography has been part of the problem that has led to this separation um, of a kind of living practice of architecture. So while I would like to have a name, I think it may be a problem to try to create a name. Because what happens after you give this a name? What's the next thing? Well, we know uh, what modernists did. They called post-historical architecture modern, which means it's of our time and there is nothing any more to happen. It was Huberis, pure Huberis, of course, in the 1920s to call that modern. It's ever blooming. There is nothing any more that could come thereafter. As I said, French uh, uh, um, um, literary criticism created the, uh, the uh, cold-bloodedly the term well, if there is modern, then it is an ism soon enough as a phenomenon, then it's modernism. And if we think this phenomenon in literary criticism is not appropriate anymore for what we have in mind, well then call it postmodernism. That's mm -hmm. the revenge of history <laughs> in, in, in a way. But I'm happy to hear that you two are, uh, are struggling. Yeah. One, one thing that I... Uh, this recalls, in, in my mind, it goes back to the naming of the galleries that we did in the American Wing. And again, in the director's office talking about calling them the classical galleries. How can you call those the classical galleries? <laughs> I said, uh, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> but they were the American classical galleries. But it takes me to another point about the the way you define collections in a museum. You know, we have a modern and contemporary department, and in the modern and contemporary department, you have Michael Graves' chairs on display, right? So there they are considered contemporary. Are they modern? Are they walking the line between the two? Um, Michael Graves' designs for silver and metalwork. Um, I think I think you're on to something is what I'm driving at here that that it becomes inevitable that it's all part of the modern mm -hmm. I, I, I think these are you know? very good points and um, uh, really to take up Rotal, your initial question and and, mm -hmm. and uh, Christine uh, I, I think we we really do need to reclaim the word modern uh, you know make it clear that the movement that they're talking about 
modernism is a historical movement mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and that uh, when they are working in that idiom they are working in an historical style mm -hmm. um, uh, you know very shortly it will be a hundred years old uh, and the idea that it is somehow still uniquely suited to our time a um, hundred years after its inception is, is a fallacy um, so I think that the the idea of, of uh, ensuring that we, we we use the term modern, modern classical movement or modern traditional architecture, um, and and set you know categorize the modernist style as an ism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think might 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 be one way of of uh, tackling that. Uh, Martin, do you have anything to 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 add to that? No. Uh, coming. Yeah, from? I, I think the main problem is if if you believe in zeitgeist, in spirit of our time, who is uh, somehow. How um, directed your life, or uh, if you don't believe uh, in in spirit of your time. So uh, the the ideology of modernism is cursed by this by this belief. It's it's some kind of uh, religion, and if we don't share this religion, we are free of it. So uh, maybe people here in this room don't share this modernist belief. So uh, we are speaking about modernism like uh, if we are uh, like if we were speaking about some kind of uh, Aboriginal belief in Australia or uh, in the Southern America in jungle. Yeah, for, for me, it's modernism something what I can't accept because I don't believe in modernism. And the second thought. Um, you uh, named modernism as a as a style of the past. Okay. Uh, however, how do you uh, name or how do you describe a uh, style of Kalatrava, Geri, Zahadid, and this kind of neo-modernism, which is not similar to the 20s, 30s uh, uh, modernism of uh, Le Corbusier and Miss van der Rohe and so on. Modernism has its own evolution. It, it, it changed. So we are dealing with a contemporary dialect or idiom of modernism, but it's still modernism because uh, Zahadid and Gary and Kalatrava uh, are believers. They, they believe that they are contemporary and that classicism is not contemporary. So well, for that, we have the yeah. label late modernism. Richard Meyer would say late. <laughs> late modernism, uh, late modernism uh, which means a continued, slightly changing uh, uh, modernism. Uh, so forgive me for trying to be so categorical, uh, but things that we cannot name, we cannot address, we cannot deal with. Yeah. Maybe it's wrong to even try to address things because we miss the aura, we miss so many fine uh, uh, grains. Any one of the practicing uh, uh, architects today, whichever uh, um, direction uh, he or she is following, resists in Frank Gehry, for instance, explicitly resists in being categorized. Mm -hmm. I am doing my ideas. It comes out of me. My genius and maybe the insight from above create what I'm doing. They are denying sight guys. Well, and this, this I think is um, one of the distinctions to draw because um, if you look across the field of contemporary, traditional, and classical architecture, mm -hmm. you see such a diversity of ideas. Mm -hmm. You see people working to the Greek. You see people working to Palladio and the Roman. And uh, you see people connecting with American traditions. So you, you see a range of contemporary work that is, um, in many cases, connecting back to different historical styles. In some cases, I think in the case of Thomas, you see a continuation of the tradition that is less focused on adapting or adopting a particular historic style. But the one thing that you don't see is you don't see contemporary classical practitioners saying, I'm just going to make it up. It's whatever I want. 
it's the single biggest distinction for me is one of position and intent. Is one intending to create something that is connected to its place, its traditions, the people who are going to live in it, uh, something that's beautiful, something that speaks, or is one intending to create architecture as a personal expression and work of art that is fully formed out, out of the head of Gary or uh, Hadid and purposefully in contrast to and purposefully in their minds not connected to anything else. So it, it almost in some way seems there's those two positions today of either um, working within tradition or working completely apart from. Absolutely. So intent well, seems to be more important than stylistic category. Would the um, the responsibility of architectural historians, with the word historian playing a major part of what I'm saying, uh, to apply a traditional methodology for looking at history and change, continuity and change? It's something we don't like in our businesses anymore. Uh, disruptive change is what we talk about now, but continuity and change is an age-old way of viewing things. And a, an art historian, an architectural historian, has subtly and su uh, you know supplely could address these questions that take you from early modernism to late modernism to contemporary classical design, so that history is recognized and appreciated. What I'm hearing is that the Frank Gehrys of the world believe they're born sprung from well, the well, earth. But uh, maybe one, of, that's not true. one of the great challenges, and this is something that came up in a discussion actually I was having with Dennis Jordan uh, uh, at, at dinner last night, and, and Dennis made, uh, I think, the extremely valid point, uh, is that the history of the other modern, uh, mm -hmm. you know, essentially the, the, the modern traditional architecture that was produced through the 20th century has not been properly written. Um, and so we, we are, we are ill-served uh, currently by the state of historiography. Uh, but perhaps this would be a good Thank moment you. to, to mm -hmm. open uh, mm -hmm. it up to the, um, uh, the, the floor. Uh, Jose. Yes. Uh, Jose. Uh, I would like to... I would like to, there is a, a perspective that I think we should never lose, uh, which is the connection of this kind of zeitgeist with the dramatic experience of the First World War. First you have you know, a tremendous destruction of the individual. There is a tremendous belief on restoring something. There is this the tremendous belief on that technology is going to guide us safe through a perfect world, and this brought us to a Faustian vision, which I think was taken first timidly by these heroes of the <clears throat> modern movement, which still become quite uh, inspiring for today. But when we look at the last that were named, uh, just a group that Christine was referring, I think at a certain moment you just want to uh, dump these people as you want to dump the world we're living in. And I think a lot of us are looking at to a new insight into man, into the individual looking at what are our first feelings with things, look at what is our relation with, with the flower, with the sky, not chewing things that others have told us how we should eat and, and, and to put the shape on the cookies that we should eat. You know, there is this kind of discovery of the individual which we are trying to do. We are not saying that we have any kind of special golden key to open it, but I think we are trying hard, trying hard. It's not going back to an historical process. I think it's going back to traditions, traditions of doing, of craftsmanship, of stone carving, of things that were actually building communities. When we look at our cities, our cities are completely empty of craftsmanship. What's the role of craftsmanship? It's fundamental for architecture. We've lost a great piece. And, and this is what I think is the revision that some of us, with our hearts, with our feelings, some of us with just simple intuition, others with backgrounds and philosophical backgrounds, but this is all what these people are claiming. And I think this is um, a tremendous point when you call this the, the Athens of the Midwest and everything, because we are 
asked to think about these things. We are given a place to think about these things. And I'm so happy that these opportunities open up in other countries, which sometimes they are not allowed to bloom. But nevertheless, uh, a lot of us are trying to do it. And so uh, this is just my uh, um, point. Thank you. Well said. Excellent. Excellent Um, Philip Bess at the School of Architecture. Um, I, I want to throw out the idea that um, that modernism uh, is actually a transitional period between uh, uh, between classical traditions, communal traditions of building, and postmodernism. And the, the era that we are in now of Starkitects um, is postmodern, not in the sense that architects think of postmodernism as an event that occurred uh, in 1980, from 1980 to 1995 or something like that, but that an actual, the, w the way that the rest of the world thinks about, the way that the academy thinks about postmodernism, which is it's not teleological. Right? Colin Rowe still has, in my view, the best account of the power of modernism, and it's, it's related to something that Jose was, was mentioning about in the aftermath of the First World War, um, where he talks about the classical utopia versus the modern utopia, um, so, that, so that what modernism has in common with classicism is a telos, right? It has a view of history and a direction of history, but that's exactly what postmodernism does not have. It's postmodern in the sense that it adopts all of the assumptions about modernity and modern ways of building, right? So that the postmodern construction is all modernist, is all modern construction, but it's not teleological. It's entirely the vision of the grand architect, right? So that it's not it's 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 anything goes. It's individualism um, writ at the scale of our buildings and our cities. Good. Thank you. Hmm. Hmm. Any other contributions from the floor or responses from the from the panel? Richard's looking at me. When well, you were looking at me, Chris. Oh, great. Yes. Let's take Hi, question. Um, my name's Jack Duncan. I'm a graduate student here at the University of Notre Dame. Um, just to kind of touch on what um, Professor De Silva was talking about a little bit. Um, we started an organization in Charleston where I'm from, and, and we would kind of theorize and, and share philosophies of what we thought was missing in architectural education. Uh, one of those things was craft. And I firmly believe that um, that's the one thing, you know, we can theorize all day and we can learn to draft and these are all invaluable, but I think it's very important that we are able to touch things and see how things tectonically work and, you know, like um, just understand things in the real world instead of just on a piece of paper or even simply in a model. Um, so my question would be to everyone in your experiences, do you see in your respective institutions a focus on craft at all um, beyond just simple books or, um, you know, I know some people from different parts of the world, the Czech Republic and right. things like this, um, you know, do you see this anywhere else? And uh, we know there's a few places in our country that, that is doing small bits of craft. Um, uh, well, we have a, a design and build studio at the University of Miami. Uh, so uh, every every year, uh, one of our upper level, our elective uh, studios, so that's either fourth or fifth year undergraduates or um, upper level graduate students uh, work collaboratively on designing a small timber structure and then building it. Uh, it's uh, based on, I think, the, the Yale building program. Um, we, we, we had a, uh, a very similar program actually at the Prince's Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and um, some of you may have seen images perhaps of uh, the project that John Simpson was the tutor for about 20 years ago, which was a little uh, primitive Doric uh, pavilion uh, called the Pipistrelle Pavilion. But uh, that, that I think it's enormously important um, uh, to, to, to involve uh, students with, uh, with the actual um, 
making. And uh, you know, one of the great problems with the revolution that occurred in the 1950s, when uh, both in England and America, in Britain and America, uh, architecture was removed from the variety of uh, different learning experiences and placed solely in the university setting. Uh, the Oxford Conference of 1958 did that, and there was a similar conference here in the US, uh, was that uh, you could no longer train to be an architect, for instance, in a building trade school, uh, which was the um, uh, the case uh, in the UK. I mean, you would have architects studying architecture alongside bricklayers and 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 plumbers and things, plasterers, um, uh, and so that's that's hugely problematic. Um, what about Colorado? Yeah, we actually a um, uh, couple thoughts. Um, we have a design build program as well. Uh, it's a very uh, well-known one. It just won another set of awards the other day, the students design and then go out over the course of the summer and build uh, various buildings, um, uh, usually small uh, houses, um, often in the middle of nowhere, uh, with a pristine view, very disconnected from the realities of most of architectural practice. And this is one of the things that I think uh, I happen to know uh, sitting next to the questioner is a very talented craftsman in this room, Patrick Webb, as well as Bob Brandt, and a uh, number, I think, of design build architects here as well. Um, one of the things I think that has changed in architectural practice that we see reflected in architectural education and its separation from building and making of architecture is that architecture has gone from being about the making and thinking of buildings to being about the assembly and management of buildings. Um, so you're assembling components. You are not actually designing them to be built by someone. You're selecting things out of a catalog. Um, so I think architecture as a practice um, has changed and not necessarily for the better. Um, so I think the very design build programs, whether it's the wonderful Sam Mock B Rural Studio or the Yale first year uh, building project, Miami, Colorado, a lot of schools have design build projects, but I think they're really seen by the students even as, wow, this is fun, I get to get my hands dirty, but then they go through the rest of their education, they get out, they start working, and they spend their time assembling buildings. So the question is sort of a larger one, I think not of education, but of the practice of architecture today itself. Well, I think that the commodification uh, of, of, of the building industry is, is a huge problem. Quick response to your wonderful question. Yes, without practicing what one does in abstraction through planning in order to turn it back to practice, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, we think it's hopeless, but keep in mind, if the, if, the, if the theory of an entire movement, modernism, is to preach abstraction as the honest thing to do, because anything else would be dishonest, a lie to apply decoration, then you get precisely what Christine showed and the Bauhaus did in all honesty, do abstract exercises in, for, in forms, colors, and those kind of things. A quick reality check. A student of mine from the undergraduate courses uh, in the School of Architecture at Penn, University of Pennsylvania, was a relatively uh, um, productive and present School of Architecture. He was sent on a fellowship uh, for a full month to Southeast Asia. So think of the cost a lot. He came back, we sat together for a glass of wine, so uh, your report, uh, he wanted to have a little bit feedback of mine, and he's going to write this, and we're going to write that, and, and then he pulled out his sketchbook and showed me a few timid sketches, um, because in my course, sketching is just the, uh, the basis of it, uh, and from the screen, best by looking at, uh, at this uh, uh, drawing while looking at the screen. And so he said, well, um, I don't know whether I can, I can add the sketches. And I said, why would you not? Well, I don't know whether they permit it. I beg your pardon, your school of architecture <laughs> sends you out for thousands of dollars and expects, in fact, prescribes a written report only, and you have sketches and ask me whether 
it's appropriate and not against protocol and at least thinkable from my point of view that they add a sketch. This is a reality, a relatively vibrant reality. And so my approach is standing in the middle between the fields of architecture, archaeology, classics, uh, history, art history, to advocate drawing and sketching as something that uh, uh, has been recognized by my colleagues for Italy. at least archaeologists. Aren't they always uh, in the need of reconstructing their things? And then they call for an architect who has no idea about the material, and they use or misuse that person as a skilled servant to, you know, I mean, this is what I think, and then do something and then give it to me, and if it's impressive enough, I sell it. Uh, maybe you should have your name uh, under it as the technical uh, uh, producer of such a thing. This split of, uh, the, the, of, 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 of insight is a terrible thing. Hence my approach, folks, and that goes to both you architects as well as to our own discipline, or my closest discipline, uh, architectural historians. If you don't draw, you, you, you deprive yourself as a major tool for gaining insight. And if you don't appreciate it or delegate it to the slaves or the other discipline, you know, uh, do something nice so that it looks good, then it is an applied decoration. And even modernists hated that. So to my mind, as a pedagogical tool in a situation where you sit between all chairs available, um, drawing is the only common denominator that currently serves at a relatively prestigious university like mine as creating some agreement. Yes, shouldn't we uh, invite, in fact, even press students to do some digital, digital drawing? That the computer then is the vehicle to uh, introduce images. And once images are introduced, maybe sketching has a chance, again, because they start to observe more closely how does it look like. But sketching is still under the, under the verdict of a tradition that sees this as too detailed, too seductive to apply all the nitty gritty details to your design. And thus, it's wrong. It is, it is a lie. Uh, keep that scenario in mind. Basically, I absolutely agree, drawing is not enough. And it should be as uh, complemented, in fact, uh, um, start with uh, um, cabinet makery or anything that makes you get a feel, a three-dimensional feel for things. But here we are. From the perspective, I'm sorry, can I just yes, no, go, go ahead. mention yeah, from a, 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 from a preservation uh, perspective and conservation perspective, mm -hmm. Um, there is a, a need for intelligent craftspeople to have talent that, that have talent. Um, I'll give you an example. I have at Milford two large Scagliola columns that had been cut down by by another family who moved in there. They need to be brought back to their proper level. Um, I had somebody from the College of Charleston come out and look at them, who teaches there. He's a plaster worker. You may know him. But um, it, virtually impossible to sort of do this uh, because of the complexity of but doing Scagliola. I know there are Scagliola uh, specialists. Um, yeah. if, you, if you go back and look at no, um, the but, early, uh, oh, and we have one actually. But virtually impossible. Yes. impossible. <laughs> so, virtually impossible. Right uh, so we so, have, we've, so, we've achieved something. But to, but to, 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 match. to match the joint oh, is, right, is yeah. the problem. But 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 again, it just brought us well, into it would this. Be, it would be dishonest to do that as well. Well, dishonesty is the best policy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> We're right on the bottom. But my, my point the was that the, the level of skill yeah. uh, is such that it's very difficult for a craftsperson to have repeated action doing the same kind of work where you develop the hand skills, the sensibility to do it well. So we frequently run into, like Thomas building the Solomon columns, you know, do it yourself. 
and figure it out, you know, and back engineer how to do something. And it's amazing to me, anytime we've ever done that, it's a nice result, but the next time through, I wish we're somebody, they learned on somebody else. And the last thing I wanted to mention is, I frequently give, I give lots of talk on American furniture, and you, you would enjoy this because in Thomas Sheridan's Cabinet Makers and, uh, and, uh, and Upholsterer's Drawing Book from 1792, in it, there's an exercise in the front where he talks to carvers. And he basically says, you're never going to carve unless you can draw. And he gives them lessons on how to draw roses. Put your hand this way. Draw the rose. Think about drawing when you carve as opposed to chopping. And so I actually am not very good at anything like this, but we've had sessions where we actually follow his exercises. And God, that looks like a beautiful string of roses. And so out of that will grow the talent of the people who know how to do it. But um, I have to compliment the University of Notre Dame and the School of Architecture for having Bob here because even the practical aspect of deconstructing a period piece of furniture, uh, just letting people handle it and understand it, um, even teaching pre-industrial technologies, I think would be an extraordinarily good thing. It could apply to historic restoration, but it also leads to discovery for new potentials for stucco work in modern buildings mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. forth. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm a great believer in tactile exercises Absolutely. and drawing. Yeah. And uh, I applaud you for having this here. And I think we do have a crying need, not just for build and you know um, make and build, but talented mm -hmm. uh, uh, craftsmen. Great. We, we, yep. we have a question from the... Yep. Um, my name is Richard Worsham, and uh, I'm an alumnus and a grateful student of Thomas Gordon Smith. Um, I just wanted to, I, was, I found the comment about, uh, was it Ackerman that said, you know, was commenting on, on the being, uh, what he was commenting on, but saying that, oh, you can't, uh, you can't just build a classical building. You have to go back and create a, a way for a way of recovering it. Was actually very, very valuable thing to say as well. I mean, I understand that it can be taken in the. Uh, he he doesn't get. Uh, well, I think imitation. He, he he believed that it would be certainly to do but that. And that. I think that was a really interesting comment, and it gets back to the, something about naming. Uh, what we're doing and the fact that it's not about so much classicism as as it is about the, the, the craftsman and you can look at somebody like um, the Bank of England uh, the architect of the Bank of England who basically made himself the god of of uh, the building he, he took out the craftsman he wanted to design every single piece and when you when you do that, it's almost like the architect has to step back and not design everything and allow, and allow the craftsman to have more a part of the process. And I think that it's almost that that it's not, it wasn't the fact that he was he, he that he was designing with columns that makes him a traditional. He, he soon, you know, he was a, he was a modernist, <laughs> and that that's the kind of thing that we are against. It's anti-traditionalism. What we're doing is architecture. Uh, but the, the, but everything else is, is just anti-traditionalism. <laughs> so recovering that, big part of that is leaving a lot more for the building crafts to to, uh, to be a part I, I, of that. I think that's much more feasible when there is a healthy building community and, and you, you hmm. could um, delegate. Uh, I, I, I think it's it's much more challenging now um, because uh, they... they, they they don't exist in many places. It's it's um, well, I, I it's think, problematic. You know, one of the things uh, that we probably should actually begin to wrap up. So maybe these should be our last. Mm -hmm. uh, unless, oh, that, that, oh, oh, John, there's a there's a there's John. a. Uh, I just uh, want to add, since I probably am the one that was here from the beginning. And uh, I, I met Thomas at uh, the Biennale the first time, and. Uh, uh, as I've said, I, I've known him longer than some of his children. <laughs> uh, and I was a student at Notre Dame here, and uh, I, before Thomas, obviously, and I was here uh, uh, when, when Thomas came. 
And uh, you've all expressed how it's, uh, what the school has become, but it's become only because of Thomas. He's the one that did it. It wasn't easy, let me tell you, how hard it was it was for this change to take place. He had no support from faculty, no support from, from alumni, no support anywhere except from a couple of us. <laughs> Uh, and he, he, he made this work. It wasn't easy. They, even after the decision was made, there were complaints. And the administration wants to get a winner of trouble. They don't want to f fight things and make new movements after all. That's not what they're doing. But through Thomas's will, only he could do that. And what I, I, th I thank Christine for pointing out, uh, that beyond just this school, Everybody that he sent out from the school has widened this whole whole idea. And his influence in the community and his influence in architecture has been way beyond Notre Dame and way influential in, in everything we've done. And he's done so much for us alumni because we're now so all proud of the school that he's made. Even the complainers are now proud to be part of it. So Thomas, I can only say thank you so much from all of us. So, so, yeah, exactly. Uh, and John, thank you so much for those comments. Uh, so, Michael. Well, what a beautiful way to end. Um, it's been an extraordinary afternoon. It's very moving. I know I've, I've been moved many times already. Um, Leo Creer stood here some a couple of years, maybe more than that. And, and said that, you know, as he got older, he felt that life got more precious. And now about the same age he was when he was here, and I understand what he, say, what he says. And when you begin to see that, the, that, that, that life is more precious, and uh, you begin to realize that you also live between two eternities. And we are all here for a reason. We are here to, you know, connect those two eternities and keep them going. Uh, you know, one to receive and transform and send forward, and the other, hopefully, our children will gain, take our inheritance and transform it as well. But it takes a great deal of optimism to do these things. It takes a great strength, and it also takes a lot of your friends to do it. 
But uh, today is uh, a day that we are very, we express our gratitude to Thomas and to Marika and to their entire family. Uh, we express thank you to the, uh, your students who have taken what you have given them and have made it theirs and have gone forth. Uh, and I'm very glad to see students of Thomas is back here in the audience. I'm grateful to see many of his friends and his colleagues are here. Um, so um, I, the um, other thing that uh, it's so important for us to, under, to remain and to understand is that Thomas didn't do what he has done just by doing it. Uh, he believed in something. He believed in something bigger than himself. Uh, he was passionate about it. Uh, and he did everything he could to make those values, that way of life, uh, become what it was. And we are all reminded in our technocratic world that even though our technocracies try to give the illusion of transparency and that, the, and that more is actually now more because it's not less, it's it just more is more and we just want more stuff. But that the values that we have about our community, the values we have ab about the future of the world and inherent optimism, uh, of, uh, that we are on this earth to make it more beautiful and transmit it to those who come after us. That is the great gift of life and that is the great gift of a great teacher. So Thomas, thank you. The uh, colloquium has ended. Uh, perhaps we can uh, retire to the drawing room, <laughs> where there are drawings. That's right. Uh. <laughs>